Hey everyone, this is Jake from Inverse. Welcome back to another episode of Happy Hour. We've got a very special guest, Laura Lamb, live from Edinburgh, uh, who's here to talk about her new book coming out on May 5th, Goldilocks. Laura, how, how are you doing? There it is. I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's 10 p.m. here in Edinburgh, and I have a innocent gun beer, oh, that looks which nice. is uh, local Scottish beer. Oh, that sounds great. I decided to go for some tea. It's only five o'clock in New York. Hmm. You know, five o'clock is pretty good, but for Tuesday, I figured. Just to be safe. Um, so, tell me about about this book. Uh, we've got a a reading that you're gonna we're gonna play right after this, which is really great. But it sounds like a really cool story with really cool world. So, what's what's the yeah what's the synopsis? Uh, so, Goldilocks is about the first all female space mission to an exosolar planet called Cavendish, which is about ten and a half light years away. And um, they're basically going to it because Earth only has 30 years left of habitability due to climate change. So this is their planet B, um, and it's supposed to be humanity's hope for a better future. Um, but things on Earth are not going so well. There's rising misogyny and bigotry, and the women end up actually stealing the spaceship um, to be able to go to Cavendish because they know they're the best people for the job. Makes sense. And the book is called Goldilocks, and I know that you refer to the planet as, or the gap, the solar system that it's in, as Goldilocks, the sort of the perfect, the perfect planet. For yeah, life. the Goldilocks zone or the circumstellar habitable zone, I think, is the official um, scientific term for it, where it's not too hot, not too hot, not too cold, and it'll have liquid water on the surface. Interesting. And. I know that you did a lot of real research into space travel and all this stuff for the book. Can you tell me a bit about the research that went into the story? Yeah, so um, I tried to weave in some science to the best of my ability, but I am not a scientist. I managed to limp my way through high school chemistry and that was about it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I did a lot of research. So I got really into the podcast, Houston, we have a podcast, um, which is run by NASA. Um, and I also asked a lot of experts questions. So my friend, Dr. Sinead Collins, who I'm going to do an interview with, along with um, Dr. Heidi DeBlock and Dr. Peter Freestone on May 14th um, through Zoom for, through the Chimera Festival. So quick plug there. Um, but Sinead Collins runs a uh, lab at the University of Edinburgh where she looks at algae in the context of climate change. And she's an evolutionary biologist. So she looked at all of the algae stuff in the book, which is what they mostly eat on the spaceship. And mm. she also helped me figure out how you would potentially grow plants um, on a spaceship and on the new planet. And then Dr. Heidi DeBlock is a doctor who looks after astronaut health at NASA. So she answered some questions for me and also got me in touch um, with the former head of life sciences for the Houston uh, Johnston Space Center as well. So he also asked me some, answered some questions. I asked him one that out of context probably made no sense whatsoever <laughs> and slightly weirded him out, but I can't say what it was because it's a spoiler. Um, right. So that was John Charles. Right. And then uh, Peter Freestone is also a YA author as PM Freestone. And she has a PhD in sociology of infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. So she was able to teach me stuff that now has become very relevant. So. Oh yeah, is there any of that in the book? There is. I feel like I have to give a content warning that there is a pandemic yeah. in this book that largely bypasses children. Um, but it's not a huge focus of the book. It's not like the bulk of the book. Um, and it is ultimately hopeful. So, but I would want, I would probably want to know <laughs> if I was about to go into a book. Yeah. That, um, yeah, is quite, it, become, it became unintentionally relevant. Um, I remember when I saw the first headlines in January, I got a bit nervous. Yeah, I could imagine, especially now that it's, it's coming out. Um, it sounds like the world you've created that these women are escaping from feels a little dystopic, almost a little like Handmaid's Tale, which is another, you know, story that we often say like feels a little too real. I'm curious, how much was the world you created on Earth influenced by our own, uh, our own world today? Yeah, so I kind of basically, a lot of world building is you kind of go, if this, then that. So I sort of exaggerated things that are happening now that are making me uncomfortable. So for example, the heartbeat bills that started uh, coming into state legislation last year um, with abortion, I 
thought, well, if Earth is dying and has a, fi has a lot of finite resources, you wouldn't exactly maybe completely ban abortion because then you'd have overpopulation problems. But if you still wanted to use it as a tool to curtail reproductive health and reproductive rights, you would perhaps make it so um, a woman has to have her first child and then afterwards they'd be fitted with a state mandated IUD. And to be able to have any more children, you'd have to pay a really expensive additional tax. So then having more than one child becomes a status symbol. So the rich are still able to have as many kids as they want, whereas the uh, you know, um, people on lower socioeconomic opportunities can't. But it also still will keep um, women out of the workplace potentially for five years, and then it's harder to get back in. Wow. So I made it a bit sneaky. So it's not outright, we've banned you completely, but we've added a lot of extra barriers to get you to where you want to go. Right, it's almost worse than like Handmaid's Tale. It's more subtle and insidious. Yeah, yeah I love Handmaid's Tale, but she took a different approach of like overnight, the banks are frozen, um, yeah. which works in that world. But yeah, I took a different approach. I like it. I mean, I don't like it, but it sounds very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess more broadly, Something I've been asking everyone is what what can science fiction do for us right now besides entertain us? Um, what value is there in, in science fiction stories at a time like this when things aren't looking the most hopeful? I think it's escapism, even if um, you read something that's very uh, topical. So I read Wanderers recently, which is even more uh, unintentionally on the nose than I, uh, I am in terms of pandemics. And even though at, one, at certain points it was too real and I kind of had to take a break and read a like romance novel and then come back to it, I still found it comforting because you know that science fiction has an ending. You know that it's going to follow a narrative state, whereas at the moment we're in this weird sort of limbo where we don't know when it's going to end, we don't know how it's going to end, and that uncertainty is really starting to get to us. So I think stories provide comfort because they provide shape and they also provide different potential futures. So what I really love about science fiction is it's usually our dreams and our nightmares about the future wrapped into one. Interesting. I guess it, to your point, it, it does end eventually, right? Any story. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you a few sort of more random fun uh, questions. Feel free to say the first thing. Don't, you know, I'm, I'm curious why you give these answers, but also don't like, don't overthink it. Uh, okay. All right. First one, would you go to Mars if you could never come back? No. No. Fair enough. Mars does not actually seem like a fun place to be. I agree. I agree. I think uh, you've, you've clearly created a more habitable world in your book than Mars. That sounds good. Hmm. If there was a zombie apocalypse, where would you go to stay safe? My friend um, and co-writer Elizabeth May lives in a house in the country, um, pretty far away from anything else. So I feel like we could hunker down there and not die immediately at least. Yeah, makes sense, get out of the city. Mm -hmm. All right, if the singularity happened and you know, computers achieved consciousness and you could upload your, and you were given the option to upload your brain to a computer and just sort of live forever, would you do it? Yes, but I'd want it to be like an avatar body that I can move around so I could be a hot robot. So not just like in the ether, you want you want like a mecha suit. Yeah, I want to be a hot robot. Hot robot, like in Westworld. Yeah. Perfect, yeah, I agree with that too. Um, <laughs> all right, one more question. Would you rather be a werewolf or a vampire? Vampire. Uh, any reason? No, no, I just read more vampire books growing up. I read a lot of Anne Rice growing up. Oh, she's good. All right, fair enough. I like, these are all great answers. And of course, there's no wrong answer on any of those. Um, all right, one last question, which is, uh, what other, besides your own book, which comes out very soon, what other books or shows or movies would you recommend to people looking for something to fill the time while they're stuck at home? I've been watching Devs, which is the new Alex Gardner TV show. I just watched episode four tonight. Um, and I've been enjoying that, especially because I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, so aspects of it are very familiar to me. Um, and I like his stuff because he always asks quite deep questions and he's quite intellectual in his approach to science fiction, which I appreciate. Um, and I'm currently reading Provenance by Anne Leckie, which is space opera. Cool. 
Yeah, devs, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to devs. Devs is yeah. incredible. I'm not gonna say anything because I finished it, but it's so good and Nick it's Offer. Yeah, great. it's really unpredictable. Like usually at least have a sense of where the story is going. Yeah. And I just got to the end of episode four and I'm like, wait, what? Totally, but you tr you just trust it, right? You just trust Alex yeah. and tell the story. I, yeah, I think, he, I think he's great. Um, all right, well, that's, that's it. That's all the questions. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us. And again, you can check out Goldilocks on May 5th, wherever books are sold or just order it online and, you know, stay inside. Yeah, stay inside. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us on Inverse Happy Hour. Thanks, Laura. And Thanks for having me. Thank you. No, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, we'll <laughs> see you in the next episode. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. I'm Laura Lem, and I'm reading from Goldilocks. If it had been a normal launch, they would have made a spectacle of it all. It would be picnic blankets laid out on the parched dirt, legs oily beneath smears of sunblock, faces shadowed by hats and hidden behind sunglasses. They'd lift their filter masks long enough to nibble at packed treats. Kids would suck down juice in silver pouches, pretending it was what the astronauts had in space. Adults would sip something stronger, enough to take the edge off and help the time pass on by. Ten. Nine. Eight. If this was a normal launch, the masses would be lined up along the flight path. Excited, fairground chatter would twine around the tinny music blasting from speakers. People would imagine what it must be like for the spacefarers clustered in the cockpit, their hearts in their throats as they waited. Family and friends would group four kilometers from the launch pad, as close as allowed, waving farewell even though their loved ones couldn't see. Tears would weave salted tracks down their cheeks, and they'd be trying very hard not to remember the footage they'd seen of the Challenger, find one moment and a fireball the next. Seven, six, but this was not a normal launch. Naomi clenched her hands into fists, then released, tension flowing out of her. She was strapped down to her chair in the depths of the shuttle, her body cocooned in a bulky spacesuit and fishbowl helmet. All her senses were dulled. Nothing touched her skin but the cotton undergarments beneath the fabric of the suit. No smell, her hearing muffled, her vision hedged in. Everything was distant, as if she were viewing herself from the outside, and this was happening to someone else. Five, four... There was no one waiting around the launch pad hidden on the edge of the Keweenaw Peninsula. It had been the site of secret Cold War rocket launches, and those few who had ever heard of it thought it long since decommissioned. So there were no picnics. What had once been popular cottage country was now largely bare, acidic bedrock hostile to both vegetation and tourists. No line of cars threaded through the cracked highway that bisected the patches of dead and dying forests. No hopeful faces tilted up towards the clouds, ready to trace the arc of the rocket as it made its way up, up, and away. That was the point. They were all alone, the five women in the capsule strapped to this rocket. The launch pad was much larger than the tiny site where NASA had set up rockets in the late 60s. No one knew what they had planned. The work had been done by robots and AI, the launch sequence fully automated. The secret leaked, they would be finished before they started. It also meant if something went wrong, they were on their own. The five of them locked eyes through the visors of their helmets. The others tried to hide the fear that must have been rattling their bones as surely as the engines. Naomi's muscles were rigid as steel. They had come to this corner of the world in the dead of night two weeks ago, locked themselves in a makeshift quarantine, done each and every step to ready themselves for launch. Startling at every sound as the robots crawled along the surface of the rocket. They had to put their entire trust in machines, for humans could too easily betray them. Right up until the end, she was afraid someone would come, turn off the robots, disrupt the launch sequence, pull open the hatch and drag him from the craft just as they were about to finally escape. Naomi held her breath. The five women chanted along with the robotic voice blaring through the capsule. Three, two, one. They'd willingly strap themselves to a bomb and lit the fuse. Engines roared, Naomi's teeth shook in her skull, the skin of her cheeks pressed flat against her cheekbones. The rocket rose, shuddering, hovering over the launch pad, frantically burning fuel, battling against gravity. Victory screams came from the four other women Naomi trusted with her life as the capsule veered and accelerated towards orbital velocity. Once they hit it, each second would take them eight kilometers further away from the Earth's crest. Naomi was crushed against her seat as if a demon crouched on her chest. 
There had been so many close calls, so many setbacks. A year ago, she thought that her life's work would never culminate in that moment. Never mind her two degrees, the cap tassels and frame certificates at the bottom of a box left behind in storage. Never mind the months of grueling, invasive physical and psychological tests, the missed parties, dinners, dates, the relationship she left in the dust. She was never meant to make it into space. None of them were. So much had been stolen from them, from all women. Naomi and her conspirators were stealing something back. Conservative politicians and their sock puppets in the media would accuse Dr. Valerie Black, CEO of Hawthorne, and her crew of stealing a spaceship. But the people on the surface were wrong. The women were stealing a planet. They were stealing a future.